New Subarus are usually easy cars for me to recommend. However, their past brings up some notable red flags. Today I'm going to move past the generalizations and give you the data, some recommendations, and my personal thoughts on the brand. Despite their cult following, Subaru has amassed a group of haters stronger than an anime character after dying three times in a fight. And that's not unwarranted. There were some serious issues that burned a lot of people, and the word of mouth is strong, especially when you cause heartache and financial loss. They were bound to make some enemies. Now, let's go over what these problems were and if they've been addressed or fixed. Most of this has been compiled over years of me doing reliability portions in each one of my Subaru reviews. Today, we're just gonna be a little bit more in depth. While many of these are not going to apply to new models, I also want this video to help out people who are considering used models. So, we need to talk about it, head gaskets. This is the one that Subaru is most known for because it lasted for a long time, up until around the 2012 model year. So what happens is that the head gasket, which keeps coolant from getting into the combustion chamber or mixing with oil, begins to leak coolant into enemy territory. The coolant is mixed into the combustion chamber it burns off, making an unpleasant smell, the car becomes much less efficient, and with less coolant, you're risking overheating. So as I mentioned, this has been fixed, and the Subaru service advisors second to this. They've changed the gasket material, and they also reinforced the block. They use a semi-closed deck now. So if you're buying new, I would not worry about this, though it is worth mentioning just by design since it's a boxer engine. It is ever so slightly more susceptible to head gasket failure. Unlike other engines, boxers have cool coolant around the gasket, even when not running because it is flat, which could slowly eat away at the gaskets. Whether that's enough to cause an actual failure on its own will have to be answered with more time, but I wouldn't be concerned with the new ones as the last 10 years have been smooth. Though I will say if you're buying one of those older used models, I would make sure that that's something that's already been dealt with, or you're confident you know a mechanic who can take care of it, and if you can't get the confirmation that it's been fixed, me personally, I would avoid it altogether if reliability is your utmost concern. Concern. The next problem is also related to something burning that should not be burning, and that is oil. So we had excessive oil consumption from around in 2010 to about 2016, I think is when the last models were being fixed. There was a lawsuit, and this is something that Honda, Toyota, and other brands struggled with too. They changed the piston ring design to allow there to be less friction, make them more efficient, but over time that inferior design would fail and then oil would just get passed and get burned. The problem with this is that eventually it destroys your catalytic converters and it can also lead to overheating or scorching of the cylinder walls, damaging bearings. Again, if you let it get low enough, some people just top off the oil for years and years and don't run into any big failures, but still you want to avoid this if you can for that reason. If you're looking at a model built in those problematic years, make sure it's already been fixed because again, they had that lawsuit out there. So Subaru was replacing engines, but not all of them did get fixed because many of them didn't have any issues for a long time. And if you're wondering what Subaru considers as excessive, it is a third quart of oil every 1200 miles. Any more than that, and they would fix your engine within certain parameters. This does not mean that every new Subaru engine burns that much oil though. So my parents have a 2021 Crosstrek with 50,000 miles, and it doesn't burn a perceivable amount. So do your maintenance religiously, and I would not worry about this with any of the newer models. The next thing was less clear cut in terms of a fix. So Subaru has had some automatic transmission issues. The old torque converted Jatco transmissions weren't too bad for them, but when they switched to their in-house continuously variable unit, many failures were beginning to be reported, enough so that Subaru actually extended the warranties, and the transmission and tuning have been improved over the years too. Subaru also seemed to change their recommended service. From what I've been told, Subaru used to say the fluid didn't need to be changed. But that is the automotive equivalent to there is no war in bossing say. It really should be changed, and the service advisors that I talked to second to that. They've definitely had to replace transmissions, but for the people that stick to the 25,000 to 40,000 mile change interval, no problem. This is not even something that they just recommend. They really firmly request that you do it because even in like all the Subaru manuals now, it says severe conditions you should change 25,000 miles, but those severe conditions are like dusty roads, salt, towing, 
short in-town driving. It's stuff that basically everyone who drives a Subaru probably encounters. So overall, unlike the oil consumption and head gaskets, this is something that was a little blown out of proportion. So I would not worry if I was buying a new model. I also wanna to briefly touch on the WRX, which had some manual transmission issues in the last generation when it first started. It was pretty widespread. It was with the clutch and throw out bearing, but most of those happened early on. So if you're buying one now, I wouldn't be too worried. Other notable issues include wheel bearings. Some Subaru models, especially the first gen Crosscheck, would eat through these things. I mean, a lot of times they were just failing at like 60, 50,000 miles. And when you have to replace two of them at a time, I mean, that's like a thousand dollars at some places. And you know what, briefly, I also wanna talk about teething issues because we had like the Subaru Ascent with, and the Subaru Outback with the 2.4 turbo and the PCM recall, which caused a lot of transmissions to actually fail. And as frustrating as that can be, that sort of oopsie moment for new models is not specific to Subaru. Most people won't run into big problems like that. And if they do, that's why we have warranties when they arise. If you want a smaller chance of failures, I'd recommend waiting a year or two for the kinks to get worked out. Now let's get into something that has really harmed some Subi bros, and that would be oil starvation. This applies to the GR86, but you know, old STI owners know of it too. This is usually something that happens when you're tracking a car or if it's heavily modified and you're pulling G-forces, the oil doesn't really circulate around the boxer engine very well and can cause catastrophic damage in the right scenario. For the GR86 and BRZ, it's been happening at the track. I don't think anyone on the street has really had many problems with it, but for a car touted as a track machine, that's notable. There also have been excessive RTV usage. They basically use RTV sealant in the engine, and some of that sealant drops into the oil pan. So this is less of an issue as it is a principle. You don't want RTV in your oil pan, but it's not enough to cause oil starvation on itself. That is a different issue. Though it's something I'd like to see fixed. The more serious problem with the 2.4 that we should be focusing on is starvation during right-hand corners and elevation changes. It's caused by sloshing. I'll actually link a video where a few BRZ and GR86 owners used oil sensors to confirm the cause. For most daily drivers with occasional autocross or back road hoon sessions, I wouldn't be too concerned. If you're really wanting to track the car, I'd keep yourself posted on 900BRZ's channel as he tries to develop a solution with Killer B Motorsports. The next thing I should address is oil seepage. There were some people around that 2013, 2016 era, I'm sure it persists outside of that, that had leaks coming from different parts of the engine, but that also seems to be rare and much less serious. Something that is more of a pain in the ass is if you have an older model, they had timing belts, and due to the design of a boxer engine, it need to take it to someone very reputable because it is easy to mess up and the car will not run right if done improperly. That has been alleviated for a while. Additionally, I'm trying to focus on more commonly reported problems, so if I left anything notable out, put it in the comments section. So now let's get into some of the newer stuff that's an issue. They put pretty cheap batteries in these things standard. A lot of people don't run into issues if they drive regularly longer distances and they don't leave them sitting for very long at a time. But for others, that's not the case. Then we have more serious issues and more persistent ones with easily cracking windshields. It's not cheap to replace because you have those sensors that need to be recalibrated. Sometimes, I mean, we're talking over $800 to change it out. And something that makes the service advisors over here at Royal on the East Side very frustrated with Subaru, is the infotainment systems. They've had a lot of people experience bugs and quirks with them. My parents have also gotten that too. Nothing debilitating, but others have gotten more serious problems. And as they move to bigger and bigger touchscreens that encompass more of the HVAC controls and whatnot, they really need to improve that tech. Most modern Subarus, the biggest problems are just little quality control kind of things. It just doesn't seem like they're up to the standards of Toyota yet. And lastly, just because it was recent, I wanna mention that the Outbacks thermo control valve issue has been alleviated for the 2022 model year and I believe there's a service bulletin for it like there is for a lot of these things that I've mentioned. Now lastly I want to talk about some boxer engine downsides just because every single Subaru has one. So you're gonna have spark plugs on the side which is not super easy to change and the same goes for some other repairs that involve the valve cover area but the flip side is that other maintenance is super easy and components off of the serpentine aren't too tucked away. Now the point of this video was 
to showcase the weak points of the past and if they have been fixed. It's hard for that topic to not sound negative. So I also want people to understand that when you avoid those problematic years, they tend to be pretty reliable cars. Even the old ones can be really good when the big issues have been addressed. The boxer engine has some pros too. It actually helps improve handling or allows the suspension to be less firm as it doesn't need to compensate for a high center of gravity. All new Subarus are comfortable as a result and all handle with a high degree of confidence that varies depending on the purpose of the car. The CVTs are very appliance-esque, but they're relatively responsive and have continuously become less jumpy and more refined. The all-wheel drive is full-time. It can send well over 50% of torque to either axle and the longitudinal engine layout helps give it equal length drive shafts for optimum balance, hence symmetrical all-wheel drive. The new wilderness trims that they've been adding grant genuinely impressive off-road capabilities too, and basically all models except for the Solterra have great resale value. And since Subaru has worked hard to clean up the issues of the past, I feel confident recommending most of their new cars to people that highly prioritize reliability. And due to how well-rounded they are, I'd call them one of my favorite brands. But if we're looking at used cars from before 2017, I'm much less confident with who I'd recommend them to. I'd make sure to have a pre-purchase inspection done at a reputable shop before buying, and I'd strongly advise checking my aforementioned sources on the specific year and model you're considering to know what you should look for. My last parting thought, if you buy a Subaru known for some of these notorious issues, that does not mean you will run into most or any of them. It only implies an increased risk of problems. Whether that risk is worth it to you is, well, up to you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please leave a like to help me climb the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe and hit the notification bell for more. Follow my Patreon for an additional podcast, and I'll catch you in the next one.